Happy holidays, everyone. This will be my final presentation of this year, hence the outfit. But in addition to this, of course, uh, Santa Claus Rally starts tomorrow. We'll talk about that in tonight's video to see what to expect out of that, if anything. Uh, and then we also wanted to talk about the damage that was done in the markets today. Of course, S&P 500 down nearly 1.5%. But on the plus side, we did close well off the lows. And so we'll take a look at some of the harder hit areas like discretionary and technology. We'll also look at some of the more defensive sectors out there that held up a little bit better like staples and healthcare. Then we'll get into our trade application example where I wanted to focus on not just a dividend aristocrat, but also a dividend king that's been raising dividends for more than 50 years in a row and is now setting up with an oversold weekly cluster at an area Area where we're almost into that buy zone from a dividend growth investing perspective. So we'll see if we can lock down that stock at a more attractive price early next year. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by MarketScholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Zee. It's December 22nd, 2022. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go over to YouTube, click subscribe on our channel, then go down below into our description area and make sure you're signed up for our email distribution list. So that way you're notified whenever we post these videos. It'll also give you a heads up of what stocks are giving you overbought and oversold cluster signals at the bottom of those emails. I have to believe there's probably a lot of oversold ones here uh, tonight. Also, a friendly reminder that next week uh, we'll be off between the holidays. So this will be the last time you'll hear from, from me in 2022. Uh, so don't uh, be surprised if you don't get an email next Tuesday and Thursday from me like normal. But typically, that's the best way to learn whenever we post these videos. Also, keep in mind that uh, we're heavy users of Twitter. If you're not doing so already, I would encourage you to follow me. My handle is at Brandon Van Zee, and we really appreciate those of you that click like and retweet on these Market Outlook related posts. And then last but not least, we have a presence on Facebook. Feel free to join our group at that web address you see in the logo in front of you. All right, let's jump into today's trade activity. And as you can see, I've got our S&P 500 heat map pulled up here, uh, as is typical. And uh, you can see it was a pretty ugly day. Uh, in fact, I didn't really even realize how bad the day was. Um, today is my somewhat of a busier day on Thursdays because, you know, David and I each teach five uh, classes each week, premium classes. And uh, my Thursday morning is my longest class. A lot of times it lasts three and a half hours. And so uh, I knew the market was down about a percent when I started the day. Uh, but I was surprised to see when I got out of that class that we were down two and a half percent. So it was uh, pretty ugly there. We did have a rally into the close, so it didn't uh, close near uh, the lows of the day, which is a nice thing. Nonetheless, it was a pretty aggressive down day for the market, and this kind of paints the picture here for us as we see a lot of red out there. Stop me if you've heard this before, but there's one that stands out. It's Tesla. Uh, it was down 8.8% here today. Another just terrible day uh, for the stock. It is up a little bit, by the way, in the after hours session. Apparently, there's um, some stories floating around on Twitter that uh, Elon Musk has made a commitment not to sell further shares of Tesla until 2025. And, you know, the market has definitely been concerned about that as he's probably the, the largest shareholder and obviously he still has a lot of sway over the business. So we'll see if uh, maybe they can get a little bit of a rally here. It's been uh, their worst month in history. Remember, we were already talking about this on Tuesday and it's only gotten worse since then. Uh, so this is Tesla's worst month in history uh, and it'll likely be the worst year that they have ever had as well from a stock trading perspective. Uh, also, Amazon was down pretty aggressively today, down 3.4%. And as I always try to share with you guys here in this class and others, those two are your big kahunas within the consumer discretionary uh, sector and especially the market cap weighted uh, ETF of XLY. So XLY, of course, going to have another tough day today, I'm sure. I haven't even looked at it myself, but uh, with, with just looking at those two squares right there, I can almost tell you ahead of time it's going to be pretty bad. Uh, it doesn't help that uh, Home, De Home Depot was also down today. That's the third biggest component of that. It was down over 1%, but uh, notice how Tesla just keeps shrinking. It's rather remarkable because remember, Tesla was once a trillion dollar company. 
uh, you can see now that it's it's now under four hundred billion dollars, meaning that over half of its market cap has evaporated. And as that has happened throughout calendar year two thousand twenty-two, this square that we're looking at here has continued to shrink and shrink and shrink. Because remember, these squares and rectangles uh, are basically telling you how big these market caps are. So it does. Uh, change as time goes on. And a lot of times throughout the years during the FANG era, we saw these squares get bigger and bigger and bigger for those big marquee tech related names. Now we're kind of starting to see the opposite where many of those that got such monstrous uh, market caps are starting to see some of that pull back. Even the mighty Apple has been uh, struggling on a relative basis here uh, recently. So once again, house of pain there for Tesla. You can also see that NVIDIA had a quite a rough session today. Uh, similar to Tesla, this used to be a very important company as well. It still is. In fact, both of them have about a same market cap at this point, just, a, just shy of $400 billion. But NVIDIA, has, of course, had a terrible year as well. Uh, and its square was much bigger this year, but this was a 7% down day for it. There was some news here today on Micron. Micron actually only ended up lower 3.44%, but that kind of set the tone for the semiconductors here uh, in the morning. And you can see all of those semiconductors were lower. There wasn't a, a single one that I can tell that was up in the S&P 500. Um, so it was a tough day for the semiconductors and tech and you know speculative investments uh, in general. You can see that Alphabet, Microsoft, um, some of the bigger squares out there also uh, closing in the red. In terms of where we saw any green, one of them certainly catches my eye. And if you follow me on Twitter, I'm sure you probably know which one that is already. And that is FedEx. Wouldn't you know, FedEx was the best stock in the entire S&P 500 today. Now, it was only up 3.35%. Nonetheless, it was number one out of 500 stocks. Now, for those of you that didn't catch the video on Tuesday to hear me groaning and grumbling and complaining about my lack of a fill price in the after hour session, even though thousands of shares were traded below 154, I was trying to get filled at 153.30, and there were some trades that went off at 153 even. Uh, apparently after contacting the broker, uh, those that were done below my buy limit order uh, were what they refer to as intermarket sweeps. And therefore, uh, us clients are not entitled to those. Uh, they are trades kind of done between the brokers. So a frustrating experience to say the least for me, as I saw that stock go from $153 up to above $170. And after I got out of my class today and I saw the markets were down so much, because again, I was I was kind of uh, busy there for three and a half hours during class, but once I saw the market was down, I had completely forgotten about uh, FedEx. I was like, oh shoot, that's right. Uh, maybe on a big down day like this, it'll be kind of coasting back down towards where my buy limit order is because it's still there. It, it hasn't been canceled. It's still sitting there just like it was the other day. And uh, lo and behold, uh, FedEx is leading the S&P 500 higher. It's kind of like uh, one of those, uh, you know, life's sick, uh, life's sick joke moments, right? Uh, it just, uh, you know, once you have something that's a thorn in your side, it just kind of presses it a little bit harder to make sure that you feel it, right? So anyway, there goes uh, uh, the, the, the thousand bucks that's still blowing down the streets uh, to my neighbors, as I uh, was explaining to you guys there on Tuesday. So uh, congratulations for those of you who did buy FedEx. Uh, unfortunately, for those of us that are still on the outside looking in, uh, it looks like they're having all the fun today while the rest of the market is suffering. Uh, pretty dramatically. Now, besides FedEx, you can see um, hardly any other um, uh, industrials companies finished up. It looks like Union Pacific was basically flat today. Other than that, it was pretty much a sea of red with everything surrounding FedEx. So FedEx was clearly the anomaly to the upside there. Boeing had a tough session. You can see it was down about 4%. And as I mentioned in Tuesday's video, Boeing's actually been kind of bouncing back pretty aggressively since this fall. So a little bit of profit taking there, it looks like, out of Boeing. You'll notice down below here as well that if there was any kind of consistent green patches on the board, I would say it's probably down here in the consumer staples area. We actually talked quite a bit about consumer staples from a dividend growth investing perspective today uh, in my uh, question and answer session. But anyway, uh, you can see some uh, nice movements there. Kroger, as an example, uh, was up 
uh, 1.78% today. Philip Morris and, and Altria both up. You know, we saw Procter and Gamble, Church and Dwight, Clorox, Kimberly Clark, Colgate. All those uh, types of companies did have uh, a consistently strong day there. Uh, we actually were talking about several of those companies in regards to earnings variability today in my uh, premium class and how uh, stocks that uh, are more prone to dividend raises throughout tough economic conditions are those that have the least amount of earnings variability and it makes sense from a business model perspective and of course a lot of these consumer staples are still going to have plenty of sales and cash flow and earnings even if the economy is in the toilet next year it doesn't guarantee their stock prices will go up but it helps us feel more comfortable that their dividend streaks will remain intact unless something truly disastrous comes out of the blue in the case of something like procter and gamble as an example it's not just a dividend aristocrat with 25 years in a row of increases uh, but a dividend king as well uh, with more than 50 years in a row of increases and like i said with my my dividend kings post on Twitter the other day. Goosebumps, right? That's the type of thing that I get excited about uh, are these long-held streaks that are unlikely to be broken regardless of whatever the economy throws their way. So if there was any little bright spot there today, it probably was in the consumer staples. Otherwise, it was tough sledding out there for sure. All right, let's go ahead and now pop on over to take a look at some uh, breadth numbers. And as you can see, I've got the S&P 500 pulled up. And at the end of the day, 87 stocks did manage to close in the green. That was good for about a 17% hit rate. So 83% of the stocks closed in the red here today. Uh, for those of you that saw me grumbling about my FedEx situation earlier today on Twitter as a follow-up from my grumbling on Tuesday, I, I assure you I'll eventually get over it. I know, as, as I was saying to one of the people in the replies, these are first world problems here. Obviously, there are a lot of other people that have much more challenging conditions, and so it's important to remember that as well. But uh, what, when, when I was uh, talking about FedEx on, on Twitter earlier today, at that time there were only 20 stocks in the S&P 500 that was up, and FedEx was still the number one at that time. So by the time we closed from what would have been close to probably the lows of the day with only 20 stocks in the green, we did manage to have 87 close in the green. So it was a little bit better. Don't get me wrong. It was still obviously dominated by the bears here today. And it's just basically been a continued follow through of the selling that we've had ever since Jerome Powell's comments and you know interest rate decision here a week or two ago. Uh, so tough day there from a breadth perspective as well. Well, let's go ahead and now take a look here at our charts. And as most of you know, my routine, typically when the market is either up or down more than 1%, I like to start off with this particular chart as opposed to the typical four grid. And you can see that we had, um, hmm, Oh, this is the VIX. I'm sorry. I was confused there for a second. I'm like, wait a second. Uh, that's a big green candle there. How did that get there? Uh, I was looking at the VIX as well. Since I'm on it, I might as well uh, share that information with you as well. So the VIX, of course, is notorious for doing the opposite of the stock market, right? It's oftentimes referred to as the fear index. And today there was some fear entering into the system. You can see the VIX was still managing to close up a couple of points or 9%. I know a lot of people don't like to use percentages on the VIX, which is already a percentage, but just to kind of put that into perspective, it was a rather sizable day, even with the close, but you'll notice by the, the candle shape here that we have this long upper shadow on top of the candle for the VIX telling us that it was up dramatically more earlier in the session. In fact, at its highs of the day, you were basically at a one week high. You'll notice the VIX has actually sold off four days in a row prior to today. And at today's high of the candle, you got slightly above the high on this candle over here that started that four day slide. But again, we kind of settled back into the middle of the range there. So a lot of that fear that was pre present in the middle of the day didn't really seem to be there quite as earnest at the end of the day. Anyway, let's go over to the S&P 500 here. That's what I really wanted to show you on this chart. And the S&P 500, as you can see, has this red bar stretching down and away from that black horizontal zero line on the chart. There's these different bands on this chart with different colors on it. And as you can see from the label, the, the, the blue lines represent a 1% move. So 
the blue line on top of the black line is a plus 1% move in the market, and the blue line down below the black line is a negative 1% move in the market. And of course, you can see that the orange represents 2% and the pink represents 3%, and we don't have one for 4%, but every, every, every once in a while, you will see 4% uh, types of moves out there as well. But anyway, uh, we, we can see how this is shaping up here. Of course, yesterday was a big up day for the market and how quickly that can be erased. Basically, the entire advance of yesterday was completely eliminated with today's selling. But again, to be fair, um, there was a bit of buying at the end of today's uh, session. Uh, with uh, the trade application example I'll be showing you a little bit later, I didn't necessarily mind that. Some of you that are our premium members that uh, get are, are privy to the um, Telegram trade alerts that we send out will probably notice my routine. Uh, remember, I do the videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so I'm sure David has his own routine. But for me, more times than not, you're gonna find that my trade is done about a half an hour uh, before the market closes. Today was a little bit of a different day with my schedule because I've got my, my son home from school with me, and so things are just a little bit different here. And I did see the market starting to rebound a little bit, and I'm like, I pretty much know I want to sell a put here today uh, because most of you guys know that's my routine. On big down days in the market, I like to sell puts on high quality stocks. And so today, just randomly, I ended up selling a put um, about an hour before the market closed. Again, different than what I normally do, a half an hour. And I didn't know at the time whether that would be a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, as it turns out, it ended up working out in my favor a little bit more nicely than it would have otherwise. Remember, when you're selling a put, it's not like it's going to make a huge difference for you. But nonetheless, uh, we're up a little bit on that trade because the market did continue to rally into the closing bell for that full final hour of the session. And that candle up there is what that's going to look like, right? We have this long lower shadow, uh, meaning that uh, we were trading at the lows of the session in the middle of the day, but by the end of the day, we worked back up towards where um, yesterday or, or where today gapped down to. We didn't quite get to that level, but nonetheless, it's kind of giving you that impression of more of a hammer. I know that's kind of hard for you guys to see there. We'll see it a little bit better here when we look at our four grids in a little bit. But I just wanted to make sure you guys were aware that while this looks bad down below here with this um, red bar, remember this is based upon closing prices. It does not tell you how bad things were in the middle of the day. And if it did, then this bar would have stretched down here between the orange and the pink lines because at the lows today we were down two and a half percent but because of the bulls at the end of the session uh, we were able to kind of recoup some of those losses by the time it was all said and done and again this purple line down below here basically represents the pathway of the VIX so again the VIX was up today but you can see we are still well off of the highs of that fear index from where we were back here in the fall so it's a little bit suspicious there that we haven't seen a lot of fear despite what has been some pretty aggressive selling here in the last week and a half or so. All right, let's go ahead and now take a look at those four grids that I mentioned before. This will be chart 4B for those of you that are premium members following along at home. And by the way, uh, I just got uh, done texting David here a moment ago, and he was mentioning that he might uh, set up a end of the year uh, sale for our premium members uh, in case you were interested in that as kind of a you know a Christmas slash New Year's type of a sale. We don't always do that. In fact, we usually do not. Uh, but I think his, his mindset of doing it or thinking about doing it this time around uh, was a little bit more because the markets have gotten chaotic again. And some of you uh, may have just joined us here recently because of that market chaos, or perhaps you had been with us for a while, but uh, you kind of just uh, forgot about it during the Black Friday sale and you didn't get a chance to do it. This sale, I don't think, will be quite as good as the Black Friday one, but it'll be in the neighborhood there. So you don't have to feel too bad about missing out on that. But remember, we offer a ton of perks here here at Market Scholars uh, in order to get you to the place where you feel more confident heading into any market conditions. I think most of our Market Scholars would agree that this market sell-off has not come as a surprise. And while there are still difficulties that we always need to deal with, we have lots of weapons to help you know, fend off difficult market conditions. 
In my case, dividend growth investing has done fantastically well this year. Um, and you know, some of those uh, dividend growth uh, types of stocks are actually up near their all-time highs at this moment in time. So uh, that strategy has done quite well. Uh, we actually just closed down a short selling trade from my factor-based swing trading class today on an oil stock that we had done here recently. Uh, in other words, making money when the stock market goes lower. And then in David's cases, of course, he puts together all kinds of bearish options trades in his directional option strategies class and also help students learn about how to hedge their portfolio uh, by sh shorting futures contracts and things like that. So I know for a lot of you, if you're watching these free videos on YouTube, you're probably just getting your bearings about you as investors and traders. And you might be wondering, uh, what does the future hold for you and your accounts and whether you're fully prepared to take advantage of those types of moments? Remember, uh, David and I both started trading back in the dot-com era. And so we've both been through not only the dot-com meltdown, uh, but also, of course, the 08, 09 meltdown and the coronavirus meltdown and everything else in between. So this is not our first rodeo, but for some of you, it might be, and it might feel very uncomfortable uh, approaching a market that has been as you know choppy and volatile as 2022 has been. So obviously, everybody's in a different financial position. Uh, we certainly understand that it might not work out for all of you, but if you do want to take your uh, trading to the next level, then uh, hopefully we can help save you a little bit of money on our premium package here at the end of the year as well. And maybe that can be a good New Year's resolution for you uh, as we head into 2023. But anyway, uh, for those of you that are already premium members, this is chart 4B. And remember, this is just our four grid that will look at the four major US equity indices right next to one another, so that way we can kind of pick out slight differences between the charts if we want to. Otherwise, if you wanted to zoom in on any one of those charts, you can just right click on them, go into maximize cell, and then um, start cycling through them up here as well. So however you prefer that is, is of course up to you. Um, and uh, we, we shall see what 2023 uh, brings from that perspective as well. I actually got an email from one of our members that happens to reside in Australia. Uh, we do have uh, a handful of international members here at Market Scholars. And uh, he was wondering if I had heard anything about the um, Thinkorswim transition to Schwab next year, because right now he doesn't have access to the Thinkorswim platform, but he does know that the Schwab platforms are available in uh, Australia. And so he's kind of optimistic and cro crossing his fingers that uh, once TD Ameritrade's clients are absorbed into Schwab next year, that uh, the Schwab clients will then gain access to the Thinkorswim platform as well. And that might open up um, a lot more of you and unlock certain countries around the world that might not have had access to Thinkorswim previous to that. So just something to tuck away there. I don't know exactly what's going to happen from that perspective since I don't work from the com for the company, but um, at least something to, to think about as we head into 2023 as well. Anyway, um, as we take a look here at uh, the four grid today, you can see the S&P 500 was down 1.45%. The Dow Jones was only down 1.05%, so that was our leader today. And remember, most of you that have been in these videos over the years should know that that is the expectation. On a big risk-off type of a day, the Dow Jones should be the leader. It is the one that is chocked full of the big blue chip companies, and those are the ones that are least likely to have massive sell-offs. Now, it doesn't mean that they can't sell off aggressively. It just means that on a relative basis, they tend to hold up better than the more speculative areas like the two charts on the bottom, where the NASDAQ oftentimes is a way to take the temperature of more of the technology-oriented elements of the market. It was down 2.18% today. And then the Russell 2000 was down 1.29%. And of course, that's some of your more speculative small cap companies. Now, remember when I was with you on Tuesday, I had mentioned that as of that day, all of our charts not only were um, weakly bearish, like they had been in the weeks prior, but they were then all strongly bearish. And despite yesterday being an up day for the market, where maybe that could have called into question whether that posture would have stayed, there wasn't enough of a move yesterday to change the posture. So naturally, with today being a, a down day across the board, we are retaining our strongly bearish postures on all four of these charts as of this moment in time. 
Now keep in mind, we do have the possibility of a Santa Claus rally, right? Some folks were speculating maybe with all of these long lower shadows that we saw under the candles today, which basically are a representation of some bulls coming in at the lows of the session and you know bidding the prices up into the closing bell, that maybe that was a little bit of a head start on the Santa Claus rally. Remember, the Santa Claus rally actually starts tomorrow. Uh, people have maybe been talking about it up until this point, but uh, traditionally it is um, starting tomorrow and then we'll go through the first two days of the new year. And by the way, I actually just got done posting about this, so give me a second. I'll come over here and show you real quick on Twitter. If you're following me, remember my handle is at Brandon Van Z. Um, just scroll down in my timeline, and it'll be the most recent thing I have posted. Of course, I'll have my new um, you know, Market Outlook video by the time you're probably watching this, but you don't have to scroll down too much, and you'll see this uh, post that I have with all these little Santa Clauses on here and talking about the so-called Santa Claus rally, but a reminder of what I'm showing here in the graphic, it doesn't really help me zoom in there, but you can kind of read it here. It says, Santa's failure to show up tends to precede bear markets or times that stocks could be purchased later in the year at much lower prices. We discovered this phenomenon in 1972, and this comes from the Stock Traders Almanac here. So traditionally, the Santa Claus rally is a good thing for the market, but in those rare events where you actually end up having a down move during that time period, it can portend further weakness as we head into the next year. One of the obvious ones right here and the worst performing Santa Claus rally since 1969 actually happened in 1999. Speaking of that dot-com bubble that David and I were trading through, um, that was the worst showing during that kind of you know five to seven day period. The markets were down 4%. And of course, we all know what happened in the year 2000. Um, we went into the next millennium with a lot of enthusiasm, but by the end of the year 2000, we were already on our way to breaking that dot-com bubble down. So be aware of that. If you want to check out the statistics, again, check out my, my Twitter feed there and you should be able to dig into the data if you want on that. But tomorrow will be an important day from that perspective to see how we kick things off because normally we do get a nice little rally into the end of the year. But many of you also know that in the year 2018, we had a really difficult um, time period. That was a little bit more so into um, Christmas Eve, so it started a little bit earlier than what I'm referencing here with the Santa Claus rally. Nonetheless, uh, just a reminder that while we might think that from a seasonality perspective, we've got the bullishness on our side, there are years, of course, where that doesn't work out as expected. Nothing is 100%, so we have to acknowledge that as well. But it did have me one when I was looking at all of these long lower shadows here today, hmm, wonder if that's some people trying to get a head start on the so-called Santa Claus rally that traditionally would kick off tomorrow. So we'll keep our eye on that in the morning, but in the meantime, it didn't do anything to change our intermediate posture according to the market forecast, strongly bearish across the board. From a moving average perspective now, remember that these lines that you see on the charts, those are our 30-day moving average lines. And so um, when the moving average lines are colored yellow, like they are right now for the S&P 500, for the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and for the NASDAQ Composite, what that is saying is that there are mixed signals out there. If you wanna think about the three different colors on the moving average itself, kind of representing like a, a traffic light signal, um, you know, green means go, yellow means yield or watch out, and red means stop, right? Uh, that's kind of the mindset there. So when we have the yellow moving averages, uh, which come with these charts, what it is saying is that there is conflict. On the one hand, you have moving averages that are going up ever so gently in all three of those cases, yet price is below those rising moving averages. But with the Russell 2000, that's not the case. Notice that the moving average color here is red. And what that is telling you is it's a full stop, right? There is full, full on more bearishness in this case. There is no conflict. Here we have a moving average that is already bending lower and price is below it. So similar to what I had mentioned to you guys on Tuesday, that's one way to identify that the Russell 2000 is our current laggard within this marketplace, right? We talked about how to read the, the labels within the charts there in the intermediate readings to identify that, but there are other ways to identify it as well, including looking at 
things like the shading of the pink uh, on the background colors of the charts, and then this would be another way. When the Russell 2000 is the only one of these four with the red moving average, it's telling you that that has been the one that has taken the most uh, it suffered the most damages here uh, recently, whereas the, the Dow continues to be our leader by a skosh because it's reading on the intermediate line is 30, whereas it's only 29 on the S&P 500. So those two are kind of neck and neck vying for who our leadership is right now. But remember, that's on a, on a relative basis. Uh, you can go into a market where you have so-called leadership, uh, but it still means that in absolute terms, they are going lower. It just means that they're slightly outperforming what's going down even faster. And right now, it's the two charts on the bottom that are our laggards, and it's the two charts on the top that are our relative leaders, okay? So, a uh, tough day on the markets, that's the bad news. The good news is that we did have a rally into the close of the session, and tomorrow starts the Santa Claus rally, and therefore, maybe, just maybe, uh, we can unwrap some presents here uh, as investors as we head into the end of the year. But if that does not happen, then that is even more evidence that uh, we are expecting a difficult 2023 in front of us. And that's kind of my mindset right now. Uh, as I've been mentioning all along, even when the markets were bullish, I said, well, we have to acknowledge the truth. We're getting some bounces here. But my own mindset was still hesitant was the, the word that I used quite often during that stretch. And it continues to be the case. I'm expecting that next year is going to be a challenging one. And there will be opportunities without a doubt, as there always are. Uh, but until we get some sort of an immense capitulation type of a moment where the VIX spikes up above 40 at a minimum, um, I still will question the viability of whether we will get any sort of a legitimate turnaround that can unfold. Obviously, the markets go up over the long term, which is good for all of us long-term dividend growth investors, but it doesn't mean that we get uh, stock markets that go up every year along the way. Uh, remember that approximately one out of every three years is a down year in the market. So this is not something that's uncommon or unheard of or anything like that. This is something that we all have to get used to, we have to be comfortable with, we have to learn to manage through, we have to learn to take advantage of when the opportunity presents itself, and the best deals are often offered by the stock market when people are pulling their hair out the most and there's enough panic and chaos out there, everybody's heading for the exits at the same time, and that's when the VIX spikes and everybody is puking up their stocks, that's when us long-term investors want to step in and try to scoop up the babies out of the bathwater. So we'll see if we can get one of those types of moments here at some point in the coming year. All right, let's go ahead and step on over here to the internet now. I always like to get a chance to say thank you to those of you that help support us in these presentations. As you guys know, uh, we uh, put a lot of energy into these presentations, and sometimes we question whether uh, we are sane in doing so because, of course, we don't get paid to do these presentations. They are a way for us to uh, present to a wider audience, a free audience, and the hope there is that some of those people in the free audience will become premium members where we do get paid, right? That's our subscription model. So, um, But uh, generally speaking, uh, you don't see a whole lot of benefit out of spending uh, three hours out of your day uh, doing something that you're not directly getting paid from. So uh, we always ask you to help support us. Uh, we'll scratch your back if you scratch ours. And the deal I always make for you guys is uh, as long as you're willing to give me 100 likes or more, I'm happy to give you a full-length video. And uh, you guys have done that for me once again. In fact, you guys have been remarkable at this all year long, and I thank you for it. Uh, I think there's been less than 10 times in the entire calendar year 2022 that you guys have come up short of 100 likes on my videos. So the vast majority of times you guys have helped support it, and I really do appreciate that. It means a lot to us. It's our easiest way to get the information about market scholars out to a wider audience. Obviously, when you are running a business like David and I are, uh, where there's just two people involved, we don't have a, a marketing budget uh, the way that, let's say, Fidelity or TD Ameritrade or Schwab or somebody like that does. So our ability to get the word out about our business uh, in order to offer you the services that we do is through social media. And we really appreciate those of you that help us along with that. You guys have been great with it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Let's do some shout outs to those of you that helped support us this last time around. 
Thank you to Trunk. Thank you to Irvin. Thank you to Tom. Thank you to Brandon and to Dawson and to Dennis and Andrew and AC and Jan and Kevin and George and Gerald and David and Leah and Pam and Duncan and Doc Pink and uh, Susan and Emmanuel and Venkata and Michael and Brian and DGI and Options and Dean and Zerbero and Jam and T-Fib and Sonia and Jonathan, Jim and Keith and Camilla and HR and Tom and Evelyn and Ken and Brian and Jeanette, David, Roger and everybody else that was involved there. We really appreciate that. You know, uh, I can't to always get to all of you, but I do want to acknowledge you and let you know that it is meaningful for us. So thank you. Please keep that up. Uh, it means a lot. Let's also uh, take a look at what we were up to here at Market Scholars today. Remember, Thursday is the day that David teaches his portfolio management with ETFs class. So for those of you that are interested in the idea of managing a portfolio, but you don't want to get into the nitty gritty of trading individual stocks because you feel that the, that they might be a little bit too uh, speculative for you on an individual stock basis, we do have a class that's dedicated to the idea of managing a portfolio of ETFs based upon how David is reading the tea leaves uh, there's nobody better in the business when it comes to understand the, uh, understanding the macro environment and what the Fed is saying between the lines and all of that. So if you want to benefit from David's expertise, that's a great way to do it on Thursdays with his ETFs class. In my case, as I mentioned before, this is the day that I teach my question and answer session. So the way that it works here at Market Scholars is both David and I teach five classes per week. Four of those five classes are considered trading rooms where we have you know, different rules and strategies and different things like that where we're actually managing portfolios uh, because we believe in an application style of education. Obviously, we could put together a course player and just say, hey, go through that and you're off and running. That's not our approach. Our approach is let's put the rubber to the road and let's actually implement these strategies that we're teaching you uh, and see how they pan out. Sometimes we're obviously happy about that. Sometimes we struggle just like anybody does, but that's part of the knowledge of an education company as well is seeing the challenges that we have to work our way through during difficult market environments. Uh, and then our, our fifth class of the week for each of us is a question and answer session. And that's where our premium students get a chance to work directly with David and I and ask us questions uh, that they might be curious about. So today I got a question on the accrual ratio or uh, accrual ratio actually is what it was uh, and some of my thoughts on how if at all that could help us in the world of dividend growth investing I got a question about reviewing uh, a utility up in Idaho's uh, business model to see if it would make for a good dividend growth investing candidate I got a, a question about comparing a couple of funds in one case uh, a pharmaceutical specific fund versus a more general uh, dividend growth oriented fund. And it was kind of a, f a fun compare and contrast there uh, to look at the holdings of the two, see what the expense ratios were, uh, kind of get a sense of what the moat percentages were on each of them, and so on and so forth. I then got a question about kind of tax harvesting and how to think about that from more of a dividend investing perspective, if there were any techniques that we could think of from that perspective. And then I got a question from one of our newer members, and thank you again, Sandeep, for joining us here at Market Scholars. And he was wondering, as somebody that's new to dividend growth investing, what are the tools on our website that can help him get up to speed with that approach? And also got a question about how to uh, kind of calculate your personal yield, aka your yield on cost, uh, which does fluctuate as the years go on and oftentimes grows as time goes on. Oftentimes I will use uh, Warren Buffett's classic example because most of you know that he has held uh, Coca-Cola since the late 1980s and has never sold a single share of it. So today his personal yield on cost is over 50%, meaning that every two years he continues to hold his Coca-Cola shares, just the dividends alone, the dividend payments alone will pay for his entire investment that he made back in the 80s. So he has you know, obviously paid for his full investment a long, long time ago. And now everything since then has been just gravy on top of that. So, you know, that's what we kind of strive for as long-term dividend growth investors. So thank you to those that helped out with those questions today. It was another great three and a half hour session. Let's also take a look here at our factor selector. 
So as you can see, uh, we didn't have a change on the bookends of the factor selector, and this was put together, by the way, two days ago, so it's a little bit stale by now, but nonetheless gives us a general sense as to what's happening from a factor rotation perspective uh, to kind of compare and contrast what I showed you guys on Tuesday from a sector rotation perspective. So from a fa factor perspective, you can see that low volatility remains up at the top. So what is that telling us? Well, it's telling us a couple things. First of all, we're still in a risk off type of a market environment. Secondly, it tells us that interest rate uh, sensitivity is not too extreme at this moment in time. Because remember, the low volatility factor oftentimes is made up of things like utilities and staples and REITs and uh, big pharma healthcare types of companies. Those are the most boring business models and they oftentimes come with the most boring stock prices and those are the exact companies that make up the low volatility factor. So those are the types of companies that tend to be in favor on a relative basis when we have a risk off market environment uh, like we are currently in the midst of here right now, especially ever since the selling that started with J. Powell's comments here a week or so ago after the FOMC meeting. So that kind of tells the story up there, and it's really the story with dividend yield directly below it as well. Remember, dividend stocks tend to benefit from those same types of things. In fact, there's quite a bit of overlap between low volatility and dividend yield. On the flip side, you'll notice that low size remains at the bottom. And judging by what we just saw there a moment ago when we were looking at the four grid, and I was telling you that the Russell 2000 was the worst performing uh, index out there at a broad level basis, then we shouldn't be surprised to learn that the low size factor is also the worst factor out there. Remember, the low size factor is akin to the Russell 2000 because they both concentrate on small companies, not large companies. And there's a few different things going on there that would account for that, including the fact that um, this is a risk off market environment and small cap companies are oftentimes perceived as riskier types of companies. They're more speculative. So that's not really doing them any favors right now. And also what's going on with the US dollar, right? We've been talking about that for several weeks at this point in this very video where the US dollar has really taken it on the chin. It's really been falling here in the last couple of months. And remember earlier in the year when the US dollar was strong, that somewhat benefits um, small companies in the United States that don't do business elsewhere on a relative basis. Usually when the dollar is strong, it hurts the international companies like Coca-Cola and Procter and Gamble, those types of companies. Uh, even Apple and Microsoft and Tesla, these businesses that are global in nature. Um, but it doesn't really hurt your mom and pop regional bank all that much, right? Because they're not doing any business in Europe or Japan or what have you in most cases. So what we've seen here in the last month or so is that you know the dollar has really struggled and therefore the once benefit that the small cap companies had earlier in the this year for not doing business overseas has now given way to the opposite mindset, which is those international businesses are slightly better off when the dollar gets weak, and that's what we've seen here recently. So it's been interesting to watch that relationship kind of play itself out. And of course, there's a number of other um, considerations that go into it, but high level speaking, those are some of the things that are kind of affecting the factors right now. All right, let's get back on over here to the um, to the the charts, and let's do some twelve grid analysis over here on Thinkorswim. Starting with chart five A, this is our asset class twelve grid, and you can see here that we have a lack of green charts uh, that are on the board. Right, uh, you will find that this has been a challenging year, not just for stocks but for other asset classes as well. In fact, it's one one of the more unique things. I think when history looks back upon what happened in 2022, one of the storylines will be how bad it was for both bonds and stocks. Remember, that's oftentimes not the case. A lot of times throughout history when we have a really bad year in stocks, the bond market is there to kind of help support the portfolio. This year, it's been horrible. We talked about that especially a couple of months ago when we were setting up for basically the worst year in history for the traditional 60-40 portfolio, right? Where you have 60% of your money in stocks, 40% of them in bonds. Uh, this has been a horrible year for that type of a mindset that traditionally has done okay throughout history. 
because of what I had mentioned before, the very odd situation that resulted from us going from historically low interest rates to finally normalized interest rates, which of course means when interest rates rise, bond prices have to fall, uh, combined with the fact that inflation uh, really hit this market in such a way where the Federal Reserve is out trying to fight that inflation with interest rate increases, uh, and that of course doesn't do any favors to stocks. So this has been a unique year from that perspective without a doubt. Uh, it's been harder to find places to hide, right? It's been a challenge. In some cases, perhaps commodities have helped you, you know, weather the storm a little bit better. And as I mentioned before, the big blue chip companies like Pepsi and Hershey's and some of those types of dividend growth companies have done quite well this year in comparison to their uh, growth cousins that are out there like your Teslas and your Metas of the world. So it hasn't been impossible to do well this year. It's just been more difficult than normal. Anyway, you can see in the lower right-hand corner here that uh, the 10-year Treasury yield has gone back to a bullish posture. Now, we would consider it to be a weakly bullish posture, not a strongly bullish posture. Nonetheless, it is different than what we looked at on Tuesday. So it means that in the last couple days, there's been a big enough bounce off of these lows on interest rates that we've flipped back to a, a, a more bullish posture once again. With the two charts to the left of the 10-year Treasury yield, those are our two commodities charts, and those two had already been kind of in that bounce move, right? So it's not as surprising to see them with the background colors that they have, but it might be worth pointing out that gold has now been down two days in a row, and so we'll see where that shakes out. I'm not too particularly concerned about you know, the Newmont trade that I did the other day, the, the, the gold mining stock, because again, the gold chart has been so strong that you can give it a little bit of wiggle room, a little grace period there. And remember, if I wanted to be ridiculously bullish on gold, I would not have done what's known as selling a bull put spread on it, right? So that's part of it as well. It's not just a matter of, hey, is gold good or bad right now? It's a matter of how do you plan to take advantage of that? If I thought that gold was just gonna spike uh, from here to kingdom come on Tuesday, I would not have sold a bull put spread. I would have bought calls or done something much more aggressive, right? Uh, so part of the reason I selected the bull put spread was to have a little bit more flexibility to allow for some sort of a minor pullback. What we want to avoid, of course, is a massive pullback. And we'll see if that takes place or not. But right now, we're still okay with that trade. Right? We've had a gentle pullback in gold, but we are still well above the rising 30-day moving average, and therefore selling a bull put spread with out-of-the-money strikes, like I did on Newmont, is still a reasonable approach towards a chart that looks like this at the parent level or the commodity level itself with gold itself still above that rising moving average. So I'm not too concerned yet. Do I, do I wish gold would have went up instead of down the last two days for the sake of that trade? Sure. But am I panicking at this moment in time? Of course not. This is still an uptrending chart right here. And as I mentioned uh, last uh, time I was with you on Tuesday and also last week and in recent weeks, my expectation going into 2023 is that gold will do a little bit better than oil. I don't know that to be an absolute fact, but it is just my gut feel at this time, especially looking at the charts as they are set up heading into 2023, that it looks like gold wants to be more substantial next year than it has been this year. Remember earlier this year, gold was quite disappointing, especially had you uh, mentioned in advance, if you had known somehow in advance that inflation was going to be running rampant in 2022, you would have expected gold to have much better performance this calendar year than it actually ended up doing. The good news is it's finally catching a bit at the end of the year, but earlier this year it was in a, you know, a terrible downdraft. So I, I do get the sense that gold is going to be able to work out to be one of the better asset classes in 2023 because it's more of a traditional safe haven area. And if you think that the stock market is going to have 
uh, some difficulties, some continued difficulties next year as I do, then I think gold is a place that can withstand that pressure a little bit more. I don't know if gold is going to be a rocket ship type of a, of a asset class next year. I just think that it's got a better chance to outperform more cyclical areas like oil and like stocks themselves. So we shall see. But right now I do like the looks of that strong chart that we see there. Notice that gold is the only one on the board with the dark green background color there. So that, that bodes well. It doesn't guarantee anything. It just means that we have more resistance resilience and more buying interest in this particular asset than we see on any of these others on the charts here in front of us. Um, let's see, what else should we talk about here? Let's talk about what's going on in the lower left-hand corner because, of course, the U.S. dollar, as I mentioned before, uh, drives a lot of activity. Even if you're not trading the currencies themselves, it kind of drives how you think about other currencies. Um, you know, securities that you are trading, like small cap stocks, like foreign companies, like international stocks that are based in the United States, like commodities, etc. So anyway, the U.S. dollar was up here today for its second day in a row, so no surprise that that led to gold being down two days in a row. But it is the opposite impact when it comes to an intermediate trend. The intermediate trend is still clearly bullish for gold, and the intermediate trend is still clearly bearish for the US dollar. So we'll let you know if that changes, but this should not come as a surprise that we've had two straight up days because remember, the thing I talked about with you guys on Tuesday night in relationship with the US dollar is that it had an oversold cluster signal. So we should not be surprised if we get a reversion to the mean type of a move here. We actually talked quite a bit about reversion to the mean in my question and answer session earlier today. The question is not whether we get a bounce, it's where that bounce takes us. And until we actually see evidence of the US dollar trading above its moving average, we have to assume that it will continue to be in a downtrend. And that usually means good things for gold because that's priced in US dollars. In terms of uh, some of the charts up above, you'll notice that foreign stocks were down um, less than US stocks here today. Um, and so, you know, I'm not sure if we can expect that to always be the case. But one thing to consider when it comes to foreign stocks is that they've been left out in the dark for a long time, right? It's been peculiar to see how much the US stock market has outperformed foreign stocks over the past 10 to 15 years. I myself would not have guessed that, right? US has not only been strong on a relative basis, but it's literally been one of the leading areas in the entire globe. Uh, and that's really saying something considering how liquid and deep and wide our financial assets are here in the United States. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense that the biggest area of the world from a financial perspective uh, is doing the best from a absolute performance perspective. So I do think that in the coming decade, we're probably going to see more of the outperformance coming from other countries out there, that the United States will not be a leading area the way that it has been. I hope I'm wrong because most of my own net worth is tied up in US stocks. Now granted, most of the stocks I'm interested in are the Coca-Colas and the McDonald's and the Procter & Gamble's of the world that do a ton of business outside of the United States. So I don't think I'm gonna get totally trampled, but um, I do think that if you're trying to generate aggressive alpha out there that it will behoove you to open your eyes up to individual foreign stocks and foreign ETFs, right? There's a lot of foreign ETFs out there where if you wanted to get into Japan, you could, or if you wanted to get into China, or if you wanted to get into the United Kingdom, or you know, Brazil or Mexico or whatever it was that you wanted to target, there are ETFs that can do that for you right now. So that way you can feel maybe a little bit more calm about um, you know going into those markets that you might not know as much about, you just want exposure there. And again, going back to David's class, if I'm not mistaken, he does a lot of that in his Thursday uh, portfolio management with ETFs class. It's not just a US centric class. Because of the ease of use of ETFs, he can get into those foreign types of markets that are out there. And if we do start to see that trend unfold, where foreign stocks start to outperform US stocks in the coming decade, then I'm sure that's something that he'll be able to take advantage of pretty easily in that ETF class that he teaches on Thursdays. But today, we saw developed foreign stocks down just 0.82%. We saw 
emerging foreign stocks down just 0.89%, whereas the S&P 500 itself was down about 1.5%. Bitcoin was pretty stable here today, but remember it was last week we had that really big bounce down and away from the moving average. Bitcoin remains you know, basically a way to take the temperature of risk appetite. And right now, risk appetite is not strong. So no surprise, Bitcoin remains below a falling moving average in this case. Let's go ahead and now take a look here at our sectors. And this is chart 5C for those of you following along at home. And we don't have a single green chart on the board. It is a clean sweep for US sectors, at least on a market cap weighted perspective. Uh, when it comes to intermediate postures shown by the market forecast technical indicator. Now, obviously, some charts are going to look better than others, but it is a clean sweep of bearishness here. Shouldn't be too surprising to hear that, considering the big amount of selling we saw last week. But still, um, you know, it's a little bit of a wake-up call because a lot of people might have caught, uh, been caught a little bit off guard with this move here recently, simply because they assumed that this would be a strong time of the year for the U.S. stock market, as it oftentimes is in December. But this is a good reminder that not every year pans out the way that you might expect. So it's important to keep your eyes on the charts and obviously. Obviously, we're still carving out lower highs and lower lows on the S&P 500, which have been in place all year long. So hopefully for most of you that have watched these videos, this is not particularly surprising. Nonetheless, I have no doubt that there are some people out there elsewhere that are surprised by these events. So let's talk it through and see where some of the biggest damage has been done. As I mentioned earlier, when looking at the heat map, uh, do not be surprised if the discretionary sector did the worst today. And guess what? That's exactly what happened. XLY was down 2.57%. And the other area that I pointed out specifically on the, uh, the heat map uh, that includes the semiconductors that were down aggressively with Micron here today and NVIDIA uh, technology was the second worst performer today. So discretionary was down 2.57% with Tesla and Amazon. And then you've got technology down 2.52% today because of Micron and NVIDIA and those other semiconductors. So those were the two areas that were directly in the blast zone here today. In terms of where we saw some semblance of strength, keep in mind none of these sectors were up today, but healthcare at least weathered the storm a little bit better. It was only down 0.14% today, and then consumer staples were only down 0.23% today. So those were your best relative performers today, whereas discretionary technology were our worst relative performers. And remember what I would mentioned to you on Tuesday, that if I had my way and I could live in a perfect world where I could wave a magic wand, and if I wanted bullishness out of the market, what three sectors I wanted to be bullish? Well, I wanted discretionary, technology and communications to be bullish. And guess what? Those are not bullish at all. In fact, they're the opposite. They are leading the way to the downside. So that does not portend good things as we head into 2023, at least in my book. If we're in a market environment that's being led on a relative basis by the defensive categories on the bottom rung, that's not a very healthy market environment, at least in most people's eyes. So um, we shall see. But right now, I don't think uh, it's, it's set up too well going into next year. Notice that we do have a number of these sectors now with red moving averages as well, including financials, discretionary, and also energy. So those are some of the areas that are struggling the most on a repeated basis according to the 30-day moving average as well. All right, let's go ahead and get into our trade application example for the day. And I already hinted at this earlier that it would be another sold put uh, trading idea. Uh, again, remember that when the markets are down more than 1%, I traditionally go out of my way to look for stocks that have been maybe unfairly punished recently. Uh, in fact, uh, what I did a week ago, I believe, when the markets were down 1% was a sold put on, on Tyson Foods. And uh, guess what? Tyson Foods was one of the 17% of stocks that closed in the green today. It's not that that stock or that trade is done particularly well, but I'm just kind of pointing out that that's kind of the mindset that I have. On days when the stock market is down aggressively are days when the VIX is up aggressively. And when that's happening, if you are willing to be a put seller, you are getting more bang for your buck on those days. 
And so I like to kind of step in to um, the danger, so to speak, right? Uh, kind of like a, a fireman goes into the house that's on fire and smoking. That's the way I tend to think of put selling, not put buying, but I want to go into the danger because that's when the rewards are the biggest. It can also be very dangerous. So you have to understand that and acknowledge it. And just like I said with Tyson Foods, you know, um, if you don't want to be uh, the owner of that stock, at a lower level, then don't pursue this trade idea. So with that disclosure out of the way, I'm gonna show you Target. This is a dividend aristocrat, not only that, but a dividend king. In fact, I was um, speaking with some folks on Twitter here the other day when I posted that graphic of the dividend kings, and one of them had mentioned that, I think it was Jonah had mentioned, that uh, he was surprised by some of them, especially Target, because in his head, Target hasn't even been around for 50 years, let alone raising dividends for 50 years. And he's partially right about that, because Target... Uh, was once known as Dayton Hudson's. For those of you that grew up in the Midwest like I did, you'll recognize that name. For those of you that grew up on the coast, you probably don't recognize that name. But it was a huge department store um, in the Midwest, like Chicago, Minneapolis, St. Louis, you know, that type of a mindset there. Anyway, uh, they had this little offshoot idea called discount retailing that was a minor part of their business several decades ago that eventually turned into Target. And wouldn't you know, that idea lit the world on fire. This was at a time when, of course, Kmart and um, you know Walmart and other discounters were coming to life as well. And so uh, it was a very unique corporate history where the parent eventually got completely dwarfed by the child, in this case, the parent being Dayton Hudson's and the child being Target, that they actually changed the entire company's name to Target eventually. And of course, that has been the focus of the overall organization over the years. So uh, if you look at the uh, history of that combined company over the years, they've grown their dividends for over a half of a century. That's really saying something, right? I'm I'm not even 50 myself, so my entire life has known nothing but this publicly traded company raising dividends every year, regardless of economic conditions. As you can see, Target has had a very difficult year, and that is often the case. Target, remember, is considered a consumer discretionary company, whereas its direct competition of Walmart is actually considered a consumer staples company. A little bit of a surprise there for some people, perhaps, but it bases, basically is because of what they sell, right? Target sells a little bit more discretionary items, whereas Walmart sells a little bit more food. Anyway, as you can see, things have gotten so bad for Target that they have yet another oversold weekly cluster. You can see we had another oversold cluster here at the beginning of October. You had more cluster signals here in June as well earlier this year. Notice that the stock market responded in kind with a reversion to the mean move higher after that set of clusters and also after that set of clusters. It also did so after these oversold clusters up here where the market did go the opposite direction to the upside. But these ones I wouldn't have cons uh, seriously considered for a put selling idea because you're way up in this orange zone. For those of you that are not familiar with this dividend stair step chart, at a high level, think of the orange zone as overvalued and the blue zone down below as undervalued. In fact, many of you that were with me uh, when I was teaching dividend classes over at TD Ameritrade slash Invest Tools will likely still own Target because we bought Target over and over and over again during this period of time back here in 2016 and 17, et cetera, because that's when it was in the blue zone regularly. But after it was there and the value investors and dividend growth investors got their fill, then it erupted to all-time highs up here to about $270 per share, even though we were buying it down here closer to 50 bucks per share. So this actually ended up being a great dividend growth investment over the years for many of my students that I taught in those classes. But this year, again, has been a difficult one where you've seen selling pressure in Target mostly, and it's gotten to such a point where once again, the sellers are overwhelming the buyers to a point where this little dot is showing up in the chart telling us that on a weekly chart perspective, we now have oversold conditions according to the market forecast. Now you'll notice that Target is not quite trading in the blue zone right now the way that it was back here several years ago. So in other words, 
it's not quite at an attractive enough place to just buy the stock outright according to the rules that I teach, we would want target stock to have a dividend yield of at least 3.34%. And right now its yield is only 3.06%. But this is a good setup then for the mindset of selling a put where your strike price is into the blue zone. And what I did here today about an hour before the market closed, again, sent out all those you know, uh, telegram alerts to those of you that are premium members, but I sold the February 120 strikes. And so that would put us about right here in the chart, which clearly you can see would take us into the blue zone. And at $120 per share, you would have a yield well in excess of 3.34%. So there we would feel much more comfortable buying 100 shares. So that's kind of the idea of selling a put. You get paid something up front, what's known as a premium or a credit, that is yours to do whatever you want with. What you have to exchange for that premium is your willingness to buy the stock if it were to fall below your strike price on expiration day. And so you have to be a willing buyer of Target at 120. And if you're not, and that's fine, right? Everybody thinks about these things differently. If you think Target's gonna have another really hard year next year, you're probably gonna wanna pass on this trade idea. But if you're somebody that was looking at Target all these years and saying, dog, dog, doggone it, I should have been buying that stock in Brandon's classes here in the blue zone, and then just watch it rip to all time highs, and you've been waiting patiently and patiently and patiently for a pullback, well, you finally got a legitimate one, and now you're starting to get into that area where you're sniffing around more of a value once again. So um, we, we were able to get that trade done. We'll see how it does going into 2023. And of course, remember, you're not always locked into your position either. If things get out of hand, you can always roll out of your trades. So keep that in the back of your mind there as well. But I thought that was kind of a unique setup just simply because this is a dividend king, one that has been very overbought, uh, very expensive uh, for many years at this point, and finally is getting to an area where us dividend growth investors are becoming more interested once again. And again, for those of you that might consider uh, a premium subscription at Market Scholars, this uh, dividend stair step chart uh, is made available on over 600 dividend stocks. And I do manual calculations in order to build these lines that you see right here. And I do that at the beginning of every calendar year. So I will be getting the new charts out here within just a few weeks. And these lines will be changing once those calculations are done. And so that'll be another nice little perk for those of you that might decide to join us here in the near term, that you're gonna get some fresh charts when it comes to chart 2A as well. So keep that in the back of your mind. But that's what I had for you here today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. As always, if you did, it would mean a lot to me if you could just simply click like there on Twitter, uh, however you choose to do that, either uh, looking at my pinned tweet at the top of my timeline or doing it below the video that you're watching on our website or getting access to that tweet within the description of the YouTube video or on the email. All four of those places will get you back to the tweet in question, but that's your best way to say thank you. Uh, and uh, speaking of thank yous, thank all of you for uh, being uh, privy to this year. It's been a challenging one, of course, but one that David and I are both quite proud of that we've been able to get through without as much difficulties as many other participants in the marketplace. And uh, we couldn't do it without you. Obviously, David and I have our thoughts about the markets and we could do that on our own, but uh, to be able to have a voice in this market the way that you guys have given us a voice means a lot. And we hope that you've benefited from our analysis along the way uh, as as well. So uh, in that time of a year where, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, the holiday spirits are alive and well, uh, just wanted to wish you all a very Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, uh, as Seinfeld would say, Happy Festivus for the rest of us, uh, or whatever holiday is that you're celebrating right now. Uh, this will be my last time that you, you hear from me this calendar year, so I look forward to joining forces with you all in 2020. So enjoy the next week with your friends and family and loved ones, and we'll circle back at the start of next year, roll up our sleeves, and get ready to get to work once again. So until next time, I want to wish you all the best of success with your trades and your investments. Goodbye for now.